So let's begin. First of all, in one of our textbooks, the one edited by Sandy and Giese, uh, in the essay written by Ronald Giese on the forms of literature in the Old Testament, he provides you with this diagram on page 18. Memorize these 10 forms of Hebrew literature, these, these 10 genres. They break him themselves into three groups, prose, poetry, and prophecy. But what you've got to remember is the 10. Law, narrative, history, oracles of salvation, announcements of judgment, apocalyptic, lament, praise, proverbs, and other wisdom. Those are the 10. So make certain that you memorize those 10. I'm not going to ask you to draw the diagram, but there'll be a list for you to write all 10. And that's a guaranteed question on the final exam. So it's a good time to become familiar with it and to understand. 18, page 18. This diagram's on page 18. And also, this diagram is uploaded in this literary analysis PowerPoint under course documents on Joule as well. So you have my colored rendition as well as the black and white in your textbook. All right. Now, one of the reasons we talk about these things is to be prepared for a full and complete exegesis of the text. I mean, this is kind of a hilarious situation. Uh, you can imagine the concern of the individual who's in charge of this donkey cart in Pakistan because he's got to figure a way to get some weight off of the cart to allow the donkey to come down. Or, and one of the ways he's going to have to do that is to walk up the uh, arms of the cart to where he gets up there and adds his weight over the back of the donkey. There's no way he's going to get in front of that donkey and pull it down because the donkey will kick him to death before he can get it down. Uh, in Bangladesh, where I spent 15 years, I didn't see donkeys this way because they didn't have beasts of burden like that the way they did in Pakistan. Pakistan had a lot more available. In Bangladesh, the beast of burden is man himself. And I've seen men suspended from the arms of the telegaris because they overweighted or the load shifted on the back of the telegari and it, it decided to tip up and they were having an awful time trying to get it back down. They sometimes get three or four men hanging from it to try to get it back down and then try to reorganize it. Plan ahead for your exegesis. Plan ahead for your papers. Plan ahead for your assignments. Plan ahead for literary analysis. You need to go look at some commentaries now with regard to your text. Whatever your text is, whether it's that one in Job 19 or Psalm 33 or wherever you are, Isaiah 1, you need to look at some commentaries and you need to watch what those commentaries say about literary devices and literary analysis of your text. Pay attention to the way the commentators talk about what kind of psalm it is or what kind of text it is. And in addition to that, do your own careful analysis and do a little bit of reading elsewhere, uh, especially in the textbook. Figure out from the textbook if it will help you identify the type of literature that you're looking at. If you're in Psalm 33, then look at those areas of Psalms. Is it a praise or is it a lament? How do you determine it? Read the article, read the essay. Ask yourself questions about your text and then come up with an identification and then pay attention because these essays in Cracking Old Testament Codes also define for you what you can expect in the genre, what to look for, and then how that impacts your interpretation and your exposition. So be certain you use this. This is going to have to be one of your right-hand manuals as you're going through, right next to the biblical text to help you in identifying this and doing this paper. Let's take a look at some examples. Most, uh, in fact, all four papers that you, all four areas of paper, the text that are in this course, are, pri are, are poetry. They're all poetry. So as we're looking at poetry, there's a number of things that we need to remember. And so let's take a look at some sample text. Psalm 97, 11, 12. Or Zaruah Latzadik. Light is sown, S-O-W-N, not S-E-W-N. S-E-W-N is to sow with a needle and thread. S-O-W-N is to cast seed. And so light is sown, it's cast as seed, it's spread. 
let Sadiq for the righteous and for the upright of heart ul yishrelev simcha and for the upright in heart joy or gladness and then the next verse verse 12 simchu tzadikim bayawe uh, rejoice or be glad o righteous in Yahweh wehodu lezeker kadsho and be thankful or praise for or to literally the memorial of his holiness which is a way an idiom of speaking of his name his holy name his memorial name as it's referred to in Exodus chapter 3 and so as we're looking at this we have to pick this apart now and take a look at it and we notice that we have or is a zarua is b latzadik is c and then we go to the next line and ul yishrelev is counted as one because it's a construct chain and that construct chain has a makaif between the two parts there and that's not the sign of the construct because you can have a makaif between elements that are not in construct and all it does is say that these two words are to be pronounced as one therefore they're going to be counted as one word here and then you have simcha and that is a one so notice that the equivalent of zarua cal passive participle masculine singular is lacking in the second line of verse 11. so let's go to the next one just as we mark that and remember it and the next one we have simchu is a tzadikim is b and then we have bayawe is c and in the next line we have wehodu is a and lezeker kadsho is in construct making it one then even though it doesn't have the makaif and so we make that c and notice again we have an element missing we have the subject of the imperative missing in the second line tzadikim so that's what we call gapping it's an ellipsis in each of these second lines it is the verb is gapped it's left out it's understood you could translate it light is sown for the righteous and for the upright of heart joy is sown or for the upright of heart is sown joy you can add that in you would put it in italics in the second line because it's not there in the second line you can do the same for the for verse 12 uh, rejoice O righteous in Yahweh praise O righteous the memorial of his holiness okay you can and O righteous would be in italics in that second line because it's understood it's clear it's understood this is one of the characteristics of Hebrew poetry to gap certain terms that can be understood it's an economy in the use of the language and notice here if we count syllables in the first line of verse 11 or zaruach lat sadik or is a syllable zaru are two syllables that brings three the pathak under the ayin is not a syllable because it's the pathak furtive and is considered a half vowel therefore it cannot serve as a separate syllable and that's why we always pronounce the pathak furtive ahead of the consonant is under at the end of a word so we have three syllables thus far and lat sadik is three more that's six syllables in line one in line one of verse 11 then look at the second line of verse 11 ul is one syllable yish is a syllable re is a syllable lave is a syllable that's four simcha is two syllables so we have six so it's six and six but if you took zaruah and you repeated it in line two it would make eight syllables for the second line and it would make the two lines unbalanced that's why it is omitted the economy of expression since you would understand it anyway is to enable something else to be said and since upright in heart cannot be said in one word in Hebrew needs two 
it allows then this to be expanded and then simkaz two syllables where or is one where you have those two balanced there in part of the chiasm and notice it's a chiastic arrangement and the central elements of this chiasm are lat sadik and ul yishrelev so the center of the chiasm are the people who are referred to and then we can see the same type of thing occurs in verse 12 and as we look at that the gapped concept there is the vocative O righteous sad, sad, sadikim notice that we have a repetition of words we have tzaddik in the first line of uh, verse 11 we have tzaddikim in the first line of verse 12 so as we look at this what do we have first of all we have an uh, besides the gapping we have an assonance the key words in each verse that are gapped that are understood in the second line of each both begin with a sibilant one with a zion and one with a tzade they're similar in sound so that is assonance initial assonance or alliteration in those key elements that are found that way then we have notice verse 11 ends with simcha and verse 12 begins with the imperative from the same root simku so samach is back to back it concludes verse 11 and it begins verse 12 giving it a focal point and we call that anadiplosis anadiplosis is the double reference back to back we saw that in Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 where we have Bereshith bara Elohim eighth Hashemayim wa eighth Haaretz at the end of verse 1 and Wehaaretz at the beginning of verse 2 it's the same thing on a diplosis it's a hinge those that same word that closes one verse and begins the next verse acts as a hinge and as a focal point in Genesis 1 1 and 2 it tells us that the primary topic is the earth not the heavens as far as the account is concerned in Genesis chapter 1 here it's telling us that the joy and gladness is the primary theme here that connects these two together it links them like a yoke on two oxen because they're plowing the same fur furrow and that furrow here in your message and in your exegesis has to do with joy so that is one of the primary themes of this text so we have to make certain that we catch that kind of situation now let's diagram this and a logical diagram that shows the chiasm in verse 11 notice how this all patterns out notice how I've added Zaruach as the gapped verb form in the second line by putting it in square brackets to indicate it's not in the text I've added in just to show that it's understood in the second half the central elements are the focal point of that chiasm and notice those central elements have to do with the people it's not the light and it's not the joy although joy is going to be a focal point of this these two verses together because it's the hinge that's the center between these two verses but it's the people it's the joy of the people is your primary concept then that must come out next Jesus and also must come out next position so when you're preaching this text don't get wrapped up in what in the world does sown mean and why does he choose the word zaruach why not some other word why didn't you say spread or cast or something else why this well there may be some reasons but don't get sidetracked by that it's not that it's unimportant it's not that you should neglect it or ignore it it's just that you should not focus on it focus major on what God majors on in the text minor on what God minors on in the text and we'll do all right we'll accurately and faithfully represent the text so in preaching this text you don't even want to get wrapped up in defining what's that light I mean we're talking about the light of God or or what does it mean is it a reference to truth is it symbolic I mean we can get off and spend a whole sermon just talking about or and word studies and everything else and never get to the key points in these verses and really your propositional statement your theme for these two verses has got to have somewhere in it something about the joy of God's people okay 
That's what you've got to focus on. The chiasm focuses on people. The anadiplosis uh, focuses on joy with that repetition. And remember you have a repetition of the people again. Going from the singular tzaddik all the way down to the next verse where we have tzaddikim, the plural. And you'll notice again there that same type of focus. Let's take another example. Psalm 103 verse 7. In Psalm 103 verse 7, the first line, we have yodia, again with a pathak furtive under the ayin, derakau lem, uh, lem So he made known his ways to Moses. Now this is one of those cases where you can see how that an imperfect cannot be automatically a present or a future. Because by context, reading Psalm 103, uh, you're, you're dealing with a period of time long after Moses. Moses is long gone, long dead. There's no way to translate this imperfect as anything except a past. It's not talking about God revealing it in the future to Moses or revealing it this time to Moses. This is why you can never, ever, ever make time or tense a factor of Hebrew verbs. That is a factor that is determined by context and context alone. Never by the form of the verb. Never, ever refer to an imperfect or a perfect as a tense. Never, ever say that because it's a perfect, it's a past tense or because it's an imperfect, it's a future tense. That is absolutely false. That is skewing the text to a humanly conceived imagination that does not fit the facts. And this is one of those examples. Yes, this is an imperfect, but it's neither present nor is it future, it is past. And it's the context that determines it and by referring to Moses it becomes very obvious. So he, by context, God, made known his ways to Moses. To the sons of Israel, or the children of Israel, which is best translated as to the Israelites. B'nai Yisrael is an idiom. Because B'nai is used as a form to indicate a classification. Those who have the characteristics of being Israel. Like B'nai Elohim, the sons of God. Those who have the characteristics of God. B'nai Ammoni, the sons of the Ammonites. mean those who have the characteristic of being of Ammon. And it's not to be taken literally. These are not talking about sons and not referring to any of the daughters. This is not referring to children and not referring to any of the adults. Any translation that uses sons or children for this is skewing and misrepresenting the text. It's allowing for misunderstanding. It's perpetuating misunderstanding. And so we need to re recognize it for what it is. It's for the Israelites. His deeds. All right? So as we look at this, we have A, B, and C. We have C and B. Notice that A is missing because A has been gapped. The verb has been gapped. Notice that you have the elements here that are uh, referring to his ways and his deeds are the B elements. And the central elements are Moses and the Israelites. So here's another verse where if you're preaching, the focal point here are the people. That's what you've got to deal with. That's the main point. That's where you want to spend most of your time. It's very tempting to spend a lot of time on the ways of God and the deeds of God. But in the way the text is written, that's not the focus here. Those ways and those deeds are made known to Moses and to the Israelites. Why to them? How to them? When to them? What are the results to be in their lives as the result of God making known his ways and his deeds to them? We've got to focus on the people. And note how that plays into the hands of your exposition so beautifully. Instead of standing there and expounding theologically ad infinitum on the deeds and ways of God and drawing up a detailed systematic theology, you're focusing on the people who see that and it's the same thing that you and I have to do and that the people in the pew are doing as well. So what if God does all these things? What does that mean to me? How does that affect me? How does that impact me? How does it change my life? What must I do with that knowledge? How then should I live with that knowledge? I can list all the works of God, I can list all the things that are involved in his ways, but it won't do me one bit of good unless I understand how it affects me. Does it only affect how I think? 
and what I believe? Or does it impact my life itself in what I do? That's what this verse, in fact, what this whole context in Psalm 103 is all about. In fact, in the prior context, you have some details given. And this is just kind of like a summary statement to remind us that this thing is very personal. And that God has carefully revealed himself in his ways and his deeds to specific people in specific times and specific locations for specific reasons that affect their lives in very particular ways. You draw this from the form of the text itself, the literary analysis. See the exegetical significance? See the expositional significance? That's what I mean. That's what I want you to start thinking about with regard to the text that you have that you've chosen. What do you find there? How does that come out? Don't, I mean, you'll be very tempted to start preaching at this stage. <laughs> because you've been through syntactical analysis, you've been through word studies, you've been through textual criticism, the textual critical analysis, you've been through diagrammatical analysis, and now you're getting to literary analysis, you're dealing with the text more and more, and y your heart is beginning to be full with your text, it's beginning to burn like a fire in your bones like it did for Jeremiah, and you're about at the bursting point. Hold on a little bit longer. Burst later in the semester. All right? So don't start preaching in these papers. Hold yourself back. Bring out a thought or concept. That's fine. I won't object to that. But don't lay it all on until you get to that final paper. All right? Yes, sir? Can you give us some more tips on how to identify chiasms without going too crazy? <laughs> the easiest way to recognize chiasms is to look for inverted order. Have one line, one order, and have the reverse order in the second line. That's the simplest way to observe it. Um, would it be mostly grammatical, or would it also be like theological too? Or Never theological. theological. Don't look for subjective chiasms. Stick to objective chiasms, one that are very clearly identifiable uh, uh, with vocabulary, with grammar, uh, and with... Uh, 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 there was another term I was going to use, and I forgot now what it was. But anyway, you, you've got to watch for those type of things. Look for objective things. Look for the objective things. Yes, Carl? I'm so confused about how you get the point of the passage from that. The point of the passage is the central elements. These right here, the central elements. Let's take another example here that you're familiar with because we talked, whoops, it, it, I don't have it here. It's later. I've got it. I'll come to it. Psalm 19, verse 2. Remember how we talked about that? So it's the center elements that you want to pay attention to. Tim? Uh, so in this case, the center elements are, are Moses and the Israelites. Um, Correct. Except don't spend time <coughs> on the other, uh, the other elements of the verse. Yeah, I, I didn't say don't spend well, time. Don't spend as much time. As much time. So right. the, the ways and the, the deeds, they may be indicated more specifically by the context. Correct, so and they you, are. If you find out what they are, then you can talk about them, but in relation to Moses and Israel. Exactly, right. right. In other words, you want to make the focal point of your message the people, not the deeds and the ways. Uh, you want to spend less time on explaining deeds and ways in verse 7 than you spend talking about the people, Moses and the Israelites. But also you've got to pay attention, as you mentioned, to the context. And the context is very interesting because the immediate context gives a catalog, a list of the deeds and ways of God. And so because of the context, you're going to have adequate enough time spent on these elements without focusing on it here. This helps remind you that this all has to be related to people. Of the impact of those ways and deeds on the people. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And so in the previous context where you have that list, talk about how that impacts, impacted Moses. How did it impact the Israelites? How did it impact the psalmist? And how should it impact me? Okay. Yes, sir. I have a related question to the chiasms because that's something that I also... It's almost like you take them for granted as we're going through, and I think to myself, I'm not sure that I would recognize them. So you're saying, looking, look for objects that are that follow each other, re uh, reversed word order. Yes. Um, but so, just to help me practically, we're looking at this, and it's it's a poem. So should I think, is there a parallel thought? Okay, is there gapping? 
-hmm. Does the word order then help me with the gapping to start to see are these two things either in the center or are they on opposite ends or in the middle to mirror each other? That's and then exactly right. You're, you're asking are, the right questions. Are ways and deeds parallel thoughts and therefore I should see a sense of almost reverse parallelism for lack Correct. of a better word. That's and exactly what chiasm is. Chiasm is nested parallelism. It's, a, it's nested inclusios to where you have bracketed things that get narrower until they get to the center to where they're parallel in the center. And so you, the, the easiest way to recognize a, uh, a chiasm, look at the last word in the first line, the first word in the second line. If they seem to be fairly close or fairly synonymous or the same character, go backwards in the first line and forward in the second line. What about the next to the last word in the first line and what about the second word in the second line? Are they equally parallel? And then go on to the third element. Okay. Moses and Israelites just don't strike me as exceptionally parallel at first glance. But well, notice that they're both with Lamed. Notice that they're both people. Notice that one ends the first line and one begins the second line. Okay. Those are your, cue, your cues. Yes. How common, is it, how common is it to have chiasms over a, um, a group of verses? You know, when it is there. It does exist sometimes, but be very cautious. Don't go the extremes of David Dorsey, who sees a chiasm everywhere, or with uh, Willem van Gimmeren, van Gimmeren in his uh, commentary on the Psalms in uh, Expositor's Bible Commentary, who also sees every psalm as a chiasm, practically. Um, be aware, beware of subjective chiasm. I mean, if it, as you've already noted, several of you, if it's hard enough to uh, observe and identify objective chiasm, what in the world are we doing messing around with subjective chiasms? Stick with those that are objective, those that are very obvious, those that you know were planned and intended. Yes, Tim. Any uh, objective chiasms that go kind of in bigger chunks? Could, could, could That's the same question oh. Wayne was asking. Okay. There are some that can, yes, but beware of it. Could you give some examples? I'll give you some examples later. Okay. We've got an example coming up. Yes. Um, if there is such thing as uh, a big chiasm, the audience at that time, uh, by hearing, would be able to uh, identify that chiasm? It is more difficult for an audience, upon merely hearing something, to recognize a larger chiasm, especially if that chiasm is uh, subjective. It's like you listening to something. It's very difficult for you to tell if someone has given a chiastic arrangement in a longer speech. It's more easy to see if you have it in written form. So the local short chiasms like this and the one before are the ones that are more recognizable by ear as well as in writing. Okay? All right, let's do some more things here about other types of elements. Let's turn to Nahum 3, 1 to 3 and take a look at poetic parallelism and how it is mapped out in its most basic and simple form. First of all, this passage has to do with a prophecy against the city of Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrians. God is going to judge Nineveh because of what the Assyrians did to Samaria and leading them to captivity, although they were the instruments and tools of God. They, in their arrogance and pride and in their sinfulness, went beyond what God was allowing them to do, the same as later the Babylonians did in taking out the southern kingdom. And God would judge them, and the prophet Habakkuk would uh, plead for justice. And here we have Nahum talking about justice with regard to Nineveh. And it begins with hoi ir damim. Hoi is an interjection. It has the idea of woe. W-O-E, not W-H-O-A, right? Woe, uh, doom, despair, and agony on me, that type of thing, right? Hoi, ir damim, city of blood, but notice damim is plural. Whenever damim or blood is plural, it's shed blood. It is blood that is spilled. It's blood that is scattered. It's drops everywhere. It's, uh, it, 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 here we're talking about a city filled with bloodshed, murder violence, all right? This begins the poem. It has no parallel line. It's what we call a monocolon. It is a single colon all by itself that makes a statement. 
It grabs the attention of the hearer with hoy. It addresses the object of this revelation with ear damim, and the damim immediately sets the stage for why judgment is going to be pronounced. The hoy can be referred to as a part, uh, as a uh, uh, anacrusis, that is a poetic device whereby you use an interjection or a particular word that sits all by itself but is used to set the tone of what is to come. Hoy. And then we move on. And notice the parallelism is two words at a time. Kulach kachash perek mileah. Kula all of her kachash a lie. Perek is booty, loot, spoils. Milea, she is full. So it says, all of her is a lie. Booty is her fill. She's full of booty, uh, full of, of uh, spoils or loot. So we have a modifier with a subject. All of her is, is a lie. And then the subject and the modifier. Here we have a chiastic arrangement. The chiastic arrangement puts the two that have the modifying grammatical function on the outside. They have the assonance of a comet's hay on the end of each. They have the meaning lexically or semantically that is virtually uh, identical. One all of and the other one full of. And then the two in the middle are nouns. One is lie and one is loot. And um, don't see immediately any connection there, but they're centered and focused to where they are the center of the chiasm. And that's what it's all about. The idea here is that she is totally characterized by lies and by loot, by looting. The chiasmus also provides us with a merism because if, she, if all of her is a lie, and she is full of loot or booty or spoil, then this is describing her condition as one that is, uh, it's, an, it's not a good condition to be in. Let's put it that way. And the use of malay and the use of coal together show how extensive it is. It is fu she's full of it. There, there's no other, there's no room for truth. There's no room for security. And then the last line, uh, is a parallel to that middle line and it's lo yamish taref and there is no end to or no finishing up or closing out of prey, P-R-E-Y, that which uh, say a, a bird of prey feeds on animals and so it's a, that which is hunted. Uh, that's the word that was used when uh, Jacob thought that Joseph had been killed by wild animals. He felt that he had been a prey to wild animals, teref. And so as you're looking at this, that, that prey goes back to perek. And in fact, there's even an assonance here in the vowels because taref is a comets because it's in pause, but it's normally teref. And teref and perek both have the same vowels and they're both talking about basically the same thing, loot, booty, spoil, prey. That which is taken, that which is uh, hunted for, that which is wanted, that which is hoarded. And so it puts these two parallel to each other and uh, closes this out with a threefold description of the condition of Nineveh. Now let me suggest something here to you as you approach Nahum chapter 3. If you just imagine you're sitting in a movie theater. All right, we're right, right here next to Hollywood. This ought to help you a little bit. All right, you're sitting in the movie theater. Lights go down. You don't hear a pin drop because everyone's anxious to see what's there. Everyone's shut off their cell phones, hopefully. And it becomes dark. And then suddenly you hear a narrator. And the narrator cries out, Hoy, eater damim, woe, city of bloodshed. And the narrator continues. You don't have anything on the screen. It's still black. She is full of lies. Or she is all lies. And she is full of loot. 
There's not any end to her prey. And the next thing you do is you hear sounds, background sounds. Kol shot, literally the voice of the whip, the crack of the whip. You hear that in the audio. Wekol ra'as ofan, literally, and the sound of the shaking or the chattering of wheels, chariot wheels. You begin to think, oh man, there's some action going on. How come I can't see it yet? I want to see what's going on. I hear the crack of the whips. I hear the chattering of the chariot wheels over cobblestone. Something's going on. When are they going to show me a picture of it? Notice the initial repetition of coal, the sound. With sus do hair, and suddenly the screen begins to give you an image, but it's fuzzy, it's blurry. Not enough light, not enough focus. You see a movement. You know immediately what it is. It's the motion that you see of galloping horses. With sus do hair and the galloping of horses. Umerkaba merakeda. And that is the bounding of chariots. You see the horses suddenly, instead of coming at you head on, turn to the side and you see behind them a chariot. You can't quite tell, but you can tell there's a figure standing in it. And, and there, he's standing on something that's being pulled by these horses. So you know it's a chariot and it fits the clattering, the chattering of the chariot wheels that you've already heard. You're beginning to get a picture. There's some military action going on. It moved from nothing, just the narrator, to sounds, to now the beginning of sight. And when it does that, it uses assonance for that last one. Umerkeva merakeda. It has that rhythm to it as though it were the galloping of the horses. It has a sound to it, an assonance to it that contributes to what you're seeing and what you are hearing. Literally, it means here, uh, Merkaba is and chariot, the chariot. And Merakeda is the bounding chariot, the bouncing chariot. So you have sounds and now you have sight. You have two examples of each, two examples of sound, two examples of sight. And now, as we move further, the scene changes from being blurry, out of focus. The whole screen is now filled. And you can see it all. You know exactly what's happening. Parash Ma'alei, the rising of the cavalry. Wilachav Cherev. Literally, the lightning of the sword. You see the glint of sunlight off of flashing sword blades. Uvrak chanit. Literally, the lightning of the spear. You see the glinting of the light off of the spear points, the metal spear points. Notice how the, the prophet here utilizes absolutely every possible means of communicating a message that is to be understood fully as a visual message. One that we can visualize, one that we can hear, a scene into which we can enter and feel like we are there. That's the purpose of poetry. The purpose of the poetry, the Hebrew poetry, is to paint a picture for us, allowing us to better understand, see, feel, hear, smell, whatever is involved, what is going on so that we can feel as though we are right there and therefore we are no longer removed from what is being talked about. We are witnesses of what is being talked about. And as far as we know, we may even end up being victims of what is being talked about. 
That's what is involved in literary analysis. And that's what's involved here. And notice every one of these is almost, there's a few with three words, but almost every one of these is with two words at a time. The simplest form of biblical parallelism of Hebrew poetry parallelism. Here we have a subject, the parash, the cavalry. We have the rising with the hyphial participle, masculine, singular, that modifies that. And we have lahav, which is the flame, which is the uh, uh, modifier of the sword, the flaming sword, so to speak, as in Genesis 3:25 as well. And we have then at the end of it here the, the lightning of the spear. And this is all very intended to give us a picture and it's two words at a time. Talk about economy of language, economy of forms. Two words parallel at a time and various arrangements to put different things in the middle so that you can see what is the focus or emphasis. And these triplets that keep showing up, three times saying something so that we have time to understand before we move on to the next part of the scene. And then we enter this last part. Wirov halal wekoved pagesh, pager, excuse me. And a multitude of casualty, literally. A multitude of those who are pierced by the sword and by the spear that have just been mentioned. Wekoved pager, literally a burden, a weight of corpses. Pager is the word for a corpse. Notice how this is strictly parallel and then we move on. Wa'en ketse lagiwa, lagwiya, excuse me. And here we have, and there is no end to their bodies. And you thought you're done with it? No. Yikshalu begawiyatam. They stumble over their bodies. Now we've gone to four total, oops, go back here, four descriptions. And notice how this poem, this is a stanza. It began with hoi ir damim, city of blood, bloodshed. And how does this stanza close? With a fourfold repetition referring to the multitude of corpses in the streets of Nineveh. The city of bloodshed has now shed its blood. The inclusio is the violence of bloodshed, damim in the monocolon at the beginning, and the conclusion of it is the bodies. Because now the camera on the screen is showing you bodies all over the place. Bodies that are so multitudinous in the streets of Nineveh that the chariots, part of the bounding of the chariots, because you heard back there, although you didn't recognize at the time, you heard not only the chatter of the wheels over the cobblestones, occasionally you felt like there was a gap in the sound, a soft thud in the sound. And the horses, as you watch them, occasionally it seemed like a jerky type of movement. And as you watch the soldiers, you would see some falling because the blood was running in the streets so much, the gore so plentiful, the bodies so many, that they stumble over the bodies. The horses stumble, the chariots bound, the soldiers stumble and slip and slide in the blood and the gore. This is not a picture for children. This is a picture that is very real of the consequences of sin. The wages of sin is death. And the Ninevites are suffering death because they gloried in death, the deaths of others. They did it because they loved lying to others, deceiving them so that they might kill them, so that they may attain their lands and fortunes. They stole, they looted, they spoiled cities and lands and fields and houses with glee, with joy. God intended them to be an instrument of judgment to the northern kingdom of Israel and they turned it into a festival. 
And now it's come home to roost. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. You see how the poetry of this puts it in a way you just can't get from the English? The sounds of it, you can get some of this from the English reading it, granted. But when you look at it in the Hebrew, and when you're forced to slow down and look at it in the Hebrew, as opposed to just reading it rapidly in the English, these things become very real. And gentlemen, this is what you want to look for. These repetitive synonyms, these sounds, the astences, all the things that go in here, the imagery to visualize what is going on. I preached from this text one night in our church. And afterwards, I had a number of people tell me, in fact, one family took their child out in the middle of it. <laughs> and I said, that's fine. You acted as a parent ought to behave and you felt your child shouldn't be hearing this much, and that is good. You take them out. It's fine. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But this is a message in God's word, and it's a message he intends for us to hear. And we don't have to turn this in to something on the screen that is like CSI glorified, and we show every drop of blood shed, and we talk about it to, to such an extent that uh, it's, it becomes the focus instead of the message. But there is a very clear message here brought out very emphatically. And it's a message that needs to be given and we need to be reminded. This is not only true of Nineveh, it's true of anyone who disobeys God, anyone who goes contrary to God's ways, anyone who defies or rebels against God, anyone who glories in injustice and violence and lies this is the end. This is what you have. This is what will come. And it's a message we need to be preaching because one of the obligations of the prophet of God is to turn people from their wicked ways. And one of the ways God chooses to do that is describing in very gory detail what will happen to them if they do not turn. Now we're still in the book of Nahum. We're still in the prophecy of Nahum in chapter 3. Another Poetic device is onomatopoeia. Um, do you remember my going over last semester Isaiah 24? Do you remember that? Where we had, uh, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> Pachad, Pachat, and Pach, where the trap shut. That was onomatopoeia. Well, here in this text, we also have onomatopoeia. It's in verse 11 in the Hebrew, verse 10 in the uh, English, and it has assonance to it too. It has the sound that's similar. You have buka, uma buka, uma bulaka. You can hear that, can't you? <laughs> right? Buka, uma buka, uma bulaka. Now, it means empty, void, evacuated. So right away, the semantic focus and emphasis is the idea of utterly emptied, right? But it's onomatopoeia because it plays off of another Hebrew word on purpose. The other Hebrew word is bakbuk, which is a word that means bottle. And bakbuk is an onomatopoetic noun that describes what the sound is when you're emptying fluid out of the bottle. Bakbuk, 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 right? We say glug, 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 right? <laughs> Bak buk, bak buk, bak buk. So when the Hebrew speaker said buka uma buka uma bulaka, they're sitting there thinking, oh yeah, like bak buk, bak buk, bak buk. In other words, totally down the drain, flushed down the toilet. That's that's the picture. All right. See, Hebrew's fun, <laughs> and you won't find that in any translation. All right. Many commentaries even miss it. I wrote a note to uh, uh, Kenneth Barker about it for this uh, New American Commentary, Bi Bible commentary on uh, Nahum uh, that he and uh, Bailey worked on. And uh, he thanked me for pointing it out. He said that uh, he didn't even see it. And he said, all of a sudden, he says, as soon as you mentioned, he says, man, he says, it's so obvious. He wondered why they missed it. But you see, gentlemen, take, he take 
take courage from that and comfort from that. If someone who's been teaching a Hebrew as long as Kenneth Barker has been teaching will miss something like this in the text, you and I might miss it too very easily. And so pay attention to it and keep learning. And the longer you stay in the text, the more you read in the text, the more you use the text throughout all the years of your ministry, the more things you'll begin to see and pick up that just kind of slid by before. All right? And you get to go back and have the joy of greater discovery. I'll never forget the day in Bible college. Uh, it was my uh, second year of Bible college. It was before I got married. I was still single. And my favorite professor wa was a, a man that uh, was just unbelievable. He was a man who had served as a missionary in China for years. He was carried out of China, out of the Himalayas on a stretcher because of a disease that he had that just racked his lungs. His name was Leo Lapp. And uh, his, his life story is just amazing. He had two doctor's degrees. He spent time working in missions in, uh, uh, up in the Northwest, in Canada, in the Vancouver area with Indian villages. Uh, he was a student of sociology, of science, of linguistics. He was my first Hebrew pro professor. He loved the languages. And I can remember one day walking into his office to see him about something. And he was standing over his desk. He was standing up out of his chair, standing over his desk, looking at something on his desk where he had an open Bible. And he said, stand there and wait a minute, Bill. And I stood there and waited. And it was obvious he was looking at something very intently in his Bible. And all of a sudden he looked up and there was just like the glow on his face. He said, come over here, I want to show you something. I've never seen this before. <laughs> His enthusiasm for the word of God was just, it was palpable. It was something that was in infectious to see a man in his 60s just loving the word and excited about him, what he was learning, what he was seeing for the very first time in the text. It was that type of thing that we need to keep alive in our lives, the rest of our lives, as long as God gives us breath and allows us to serve him, we've got to continue to, to uh, learn. We've got to continue to spend time in the text to see those things that God has placed there. And there's a timing for us to see those, I believe. I believe God allows us by his spirit to see those things at the right time when we need it, when it helps to build our knowledge of the word and draw us closer to him. Let's look at Psalm 93, verses 1 and 2. And this is a psalm we're going to look at a chiasm overall in this psalm as well. Uh, it's one of the examples I can give of that. It begins with Yahweh Malach, uh, very fitting with our faculty lecture series on the kingdom. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mayhew was talking about Malach today and how often it is found and where it's found. First occurrence, last occurrence. Reference to humans, reference to God. Here we have a reference to God. Yahweh Malach, Yahweh reigns. Geut Lavesh, he is clothed with majesty. Geut is majesty, Lavesh is to be clothed. Lavesh Yahweh owes Hith Azar. Clothed is Yahweh with strength, or excuse me, clothed is Yahweh. Oz hith azar, he is girded, or he girds himself, because hith azar is hith, hith pael. He girds himself with strength. And it goes on. Af tikon tevel bal timot. Indeed, the world is fixed or firm or established. Tikon has the idea of to be established. It's a cow imperfect third feminine singular of kun. Kaf, shorik, noon, a middle, middle vowel verb. Tevel is the word for globe or world as a whole, including the seas, including the landforms. Some will say that it could refer in some context to just the continents themselves alone. Bal timot, it will not be moved. In other words, it's firm, it's fixed. Nakon kisaka meaz, taking the same verb root, kun, using a nifal in the participle, nakon, fixed, firm, kiseka, is your throne, 
meaz, literally from then, and it has the, it's an idiomatic way of saying forever, forever, everlasting. Me olam ata, not only is the throne forever, <coughs> but he, God is forever. The, the psalmist says, from eternity are you. You are from eternity. You are eternal. So as we begin to look at this, the same type of two-word parallelism being used that we saw in Nahum. The most basic form of parallelism. We have Yahweh Malak at the very beginning. It sets the theme overall. Then we have Lavesh acts as a hinge between the first line. In fact, Yahweh Malak would be a monocolon. It's set apart. It sets the main theme for the entire psalm. And the next two lines are parallel to each other. Clothed with majesty. Yahweh is clothed with strength. He is girded. Three times it's said in order for us to see that he is indeed God. He is a royal king. He's a powerful king. He is a king of majesty. We have what we call a terrace parallelism. When you look at it that way, notice how the hinge overlaps. It's like going down the stairs or going upstairs. The flow hinges by putting those words together that way. Terrace parallelism. Notice here we have Yahweh at the beginning. We have lavesh, lavesh. We have Yahweh at the end of this line here. Looking back at that where we have Yahweh reigns. He is clothed with majesty. Yahweh is clothed. The repetition used. The repetition of kun. The repetition of prepositional phrases with min preposition that express long periods of time. And the terrace there as well is on those words for time. Notice the assonance between tevel and baal back to back. The baith laman back to back. To tie those sounds in that one line together. And notice the progression, the logical progression. What is established? What is firm? What is fixed? The world, God's throne, and God himself. Notice the progression, how it moves from the world to his throne to God himself. From earth to heaven to God himself. What's the focal point? God. How did this begin? Yahweh. How's it end? Ata. It brackets. It's like an inclusio. The personal reference around these two verses that set them apart. Yahweh reigns is the theme. And it's first showed that he is majestic. And second shows that he is everlasting. Yahweh reigns. He's majestic. He's everlasting. He's majestic in his reign. He is everlasting in his reign. His throne is forever. All of that poetry put together to tie things up. And notice that the focus here on these repetitions is on the aspect of his showing visible majesty upon how firm and fixed his reign and rule is and how long it lasts. The fact that it's firm and fixed is because it's long term. It's not short term. It's not just overnight and it's gone. So the poetry here ties together well and helping to advance the argument and look at it. Let's go to the next two verses. Nasau Neharot Yahweh. The floods, or literally the rivers, are lifted up, O Yahweh. The floods, the rivers, lift up their voice, their sound, kolam. Yisau neharot dakyam. They lift up, the rivers, the floods lift up their literally breakers. Uh, that's another onomatopoeia. Uh, have you been down at the ocean when there's large waves breaking? What do you hear? You hear a sound that's like duck, duck. The slap of the wave. The curl of the wave and the air inside it as it collapses, the way the water collapses, make that great sound that you just can't miss. It's not the gentle lapping of waves. It is pounding surf. And you see the same thing when it hits the rocks. That slap, that's dak, dak yam. They're breakers. Uh, we'll come back to this in a minute. Yes? How do you... 
kind of recognize the onomatopoeias? Use the lexicon. Okay. They'll tell you. All right. Yes, sir. Concerning translation, when we see a chiasm, how much should we try to preserve that in the English? Like, for instance, if it can be preserved in English, do it. If it can't, forget it. Should we sacrifice readability to preserve no. it, or like? Okay. No. Keep your readability. Don't over uh, use the form. If it works well and is not uncomfortable, do it. But otherwise, avoid it. Great. From the presentation too much to show us one where you can preserve it and one where you can Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll get you to one. Okay. Uh, we had one earlier that you keep. And I'll show you one here that I actually showed you before that you can't keep in Psalm 19 too. All right. Now, it goes on here. Notice how we have kolam mentioned. The dakyam is onomatopoetic and refers to sound as well. And we have mi kolot mayim. Literally, from the voices of the water, but not just any water, rabim, many waters, abundant waters. Adirim, mishevere yam. And here we have the breakers again, but these breakers are those that break and shatter, literally breaking in pieces. Breaking in pieces. That breaking surf of the sea that breaks in pieces. It's not just the sound of Dak Yam. It is actually physically shattering the rock along the seashore. Breaking it into pieces. Wearing the coastland away. Adir Bamarom Yahweh. Mighty in the heights is Yahweh. Now, let's take a look at this. Notice the threefold line here. This is obviously a tricolum. Because all three are parallel. They have the obvious uses of two words that are identical. Except that we move from the Nasa'u down to Yisa'u. We move from the Nifal, perfect, masculine or common plural, down to a Cal, imperfect. Why the imperfect at the end there as opposed to the first two? The first two are just looking at the situation as a whole as a simple action without regard to the progress of the action. But the third and final one is not just talking about that the, the floods are lifting up their voice, O Yahweh, making a sound. They're lifted up, the idea of they're being mighty, they're prevailing, they're, they're doing something. They're lifting up their voice, their sound, but this idea of dakyam, the breakers here, is that which is coming again and again and again and again. It's repetitious. You don't get just one breaker and it's silent the rest of the night. When you have storm waves coming in that way, the large breaking waves that come upon the shore, there are series of them. They come repeatedly on a regular pattern. In fact, I can remember staying down by the ocean when I was in seminary. We lived a half block away from it. And I'd go down there and I could count and I could figure out how often the largest wave would come in. There'd be certain patterns and rhythms that would develop because of the form of the sea bottom, because of the type of storm out at sea and the, the air pressure, things of that nature. And you could actually at some times count, okay, every fifth wave is going to be higher than the previous four. And you'd stand there and count them and sure enough, that's what it is. It has a rhythm. It has a repetition. And the imperfect here is to give us the idea of the progress of the action, the rep repetitive repetitiveness of the dakyam, their breakers, as they come in. It's one after another, after another, after another, after another, pounding and pounding and pounding surf on the shoreline. So that's why you have that change that helps to highlight something. And you have to always ask yourself the question, why the change? Remember, it's like in Psalm 19, verses 8 through 10, why the change from participles to a perfect? Sadku. Why the change? You have to ask the question, then you have to discover the answer. Because it's intentional, it's purposeful. So we have to find out what it's about. And that's what this is about. It, it ties in with that word that's being used, dakyam. And then down here we have mayim adirim. Notice the, the assonance here. Mayim rabim adirim and then adir. 
pathic hirikyod, pathic hirikyod, pathic hirikyod, pathic hirikyod. Repetitious sounds. It's, it's almost like you're hearing the repetition of those breakers. <laughs> because the repeated sound maintains the rhythm. Maintains that constant, careful, spaced rhythm. The terrace here. Rabim parallel with Adirim, but repeated in the Adir that follows. Mikalot Mayim, and here we have mish, mish, uh, mishiv, Mishbere, Mishbere Yam, where we have Mayim parallel to Yam, where we have Mikolot parallel to Mishbere. And then the middle, Adir. Adir here, the, the repetition is the idea of might, power. And you stop to think about it. This whole two verses is about power. The power of the ocean and who's in charge of the ocean? God the creator. God the king who reigns. He controls even the ocean's waves. He is on high. Bamarom Yahweh. He's majestic on high. He's powerful on high. Mighty on high. And the idea is he is even mightier than the mightiest breakers of the sea that you can possibly imagine. Try to stand up under the largest waves that pound the California coastline during a storm. Go down and tie yourself to Point Magoo and see how long you last. Uh, about, what, maybe a couple of minutes before you're broken and bleeding and crushed or drowned. And the picture of power. And this was always an impression to the Israelites. Remember, there are people who wandered in the wilderness, who lived in Egypt. They were not necessarily a seagoing people. The only time we find them seagoing is in the days of Solomon when he had the wealth enough to build ships to send it out to sea. They didn't have any natural ports along their coastline like Tyre and Sidon had. These were a people who were landlubbers. Not seafarers, not seagoers. The Phoenicians were those seagoers. They're the ones who had the ships and the boats that were sent out to sea. The Cretans and the, uh, the Cypriots and the Greeks, they were seafarers. The sea peoples, the Peleshet, they were those who were at sea, but not Israel. So for them, the sea was something mysterious. It was something that was mighty. It was something that they, they stood in awe of because they were not used to going out on it. They saw the results of the storms and the waves breaking upon the shore. Go down and stand at uh, uh, Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea there on the coast, and be there during a storm and, and listen to the waves come up against the coastline because there are some uh, cliffs there. I've actually climbed those cliffs. Actually in, in those cliffs it's amazing. You can climb those cliffs. They're, they're mainly dirt. Not really what you call cliffs. They're like here in California. Like the uh, 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 mountains and hills up here in Santa Clarita. Uh, they're, they're loosely compacted dirt <laughs> mainly. Not rock. But in that layers there you look at along the shore at Caesarea, you'll find uh, tile from mosaic tile floors that are now under the soil. And you climb up, you get up about 20, 25 feet from the uh, 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 seaside there and you get up there and you find those, you can pull out a couple of those and you realize someday someone's going to finally get down there and uncover that and these are going to be tile floors in perhaps some nobleman's house or some other building. And it's, it's an amazing place. And why did they put their homes on the edge of the sea with these crumbling cliffs? Because they love to be near the sea. They love the sound of the sea. They love the variety just like you hear in California. They build homes all along and occasionally it slides into the sea and the home goes with it. Why do you build it there to begin with? There's an attraction. There's an attraction. Part of that attraction is to power. And that's the power that is shown here, especially in storm. Yes, Tim. Can you just remind me what a terrace parallelism is? That's where you overlap the words. 
It's just like going up and down steps or terraces on a hillside. Right. A oh. terrace is stepped. Oh, I see. In this case, it's the reef that's overlapped. Is, is that right? Yeah, you have ad adirim and adir. You have rabim and adirim. The sounds there, rabim and adirim overlap in that terrace. Mm -hmm. yep. All right. Notice here you have Yahweh and you have Yahweh. Yahweh up at the first, uh, Nasu, Naharot, Yahweh, and at the very end, Bamarom, Yahweh. Same type of folks we had in verses 1 and 2 with the same type of inclusio, except in verses 1 and 2, you had Yahweh at the very beginning, Yahweh Malak, not the third word in. And you had Atta at the end. But this type of structure lets you see the stanzas of the poem here in Psalm 93. And what's the focus here? Remember the focus in verse 1 was majesty. The focus in verse 3 was that of eternality. And here we have majestic, majesty. Now let's go to the final verse, verse 5. And this isn't the one I was thinking of that had the uh, overall chiasm. I'll have to come back to that one somewhere. I think it's on here. We'll see. I hope it is. Uh, the last verse, everything changes. We, yeah, there's a chiasm there. You have majesty, eternity, majesty. Eternity is in the middle. Majesty pairs it off and uh, brackets it off there. There's, that, there's a subjective type of chiasm there that you can look at. Also depends on how you take this final statement here because there's going to be another switch here. It's going to be very interesting, fascinating. Edotecha ne'emnu me'od. Your testimonies or your witnesses are trustworthy exceedingly. Me'od. <coughs> completely trustworthy. Your testimonies are completely trustworthy. We switch now to the word of God. To the Torah. To the law of God. Lebetcha for your house Na'ewa Kodesh. For your house or to your house or with regard to your house. Na'wa is a verb. Cal, perfect, third feminine singular that has the meaning of being lovely or being beautiful. And Kodesh is holiness. So for your house, holiness is its beauty. In other words here, Holiness is lovely for your house. A reference to the temple. A reference to the law. Seems so out of place, doesn't it? Because we looked at the majesty of God, the eternality of God. We looked at this scene of the sea being used as an illustration of his great power and majesty. And now all of a sudden we're talking about his word and his house, the temple. What's going on with this? And then it closes. Yahweh le'orek yamim. Yahweh is for length of days. In other words, Yahweh is forever. Now that's interesting. Because that was what was talked about back in verse 2. And yet it's brought here at the very end. Why? Because there is a key point to it. Because if he is forever then what is the nature of his testimony? You have the second masculine singular pronominal suffix used here in the two places. You have uh, these paralleled together to where you have an A sound with followed by at the end at the A ah sound. Edoteka, levetka. You have assonance. You have this that is perhaps a delayed completion of verse 1 that gives us a clue that the reign of Yahweh is forever. Malak Yahweh is the way it began as a monocolon. It ends with a monocolon. Inverting, before you had, uh, excuse me, Yahweh Malak, it doesn't invert, it has the same order. Yahweh Malak and here Yahweh Leorek uh, Yamin. And it's, it's uh, uh, that similarity of sound, that similarity of, of subject matter that is there, perhaps a delayed completion. Now, 
Remember what the chiasm was, the subjective chiasm. Majesty, eternality, majesty. The center of the chiasm is eternality. If the eternality is the focus, this confirms the focus by the final monocolum. It's e his eternality which is the point. It's his eternal kingdom, it's his eternal reign that is the point. That's what is being brought out. Remember when it talked about his eternality, what was one of the topics beside himself? Your throne. Going back to that image of king and royalty. All right? So back to everlasting. Psalm 19.2, this is the example of a chiasm that you can't represent in English. Uh, you can't maintain the chiasm because if you do, you end up with the heavens declare the glory of God, the works of his hands make known the, firm, the, the uh, expanse. So it sounds like the object of making known is the expanse instead of being the subject. So uh, you can't translate this in a way that maintains the chiasm. The center elements, remember, are the point. The focus is there. That's where we plant our flag. That's where we spend some time in our exposition because that's the important area, the important point of that chiasm. Now, you may think, okay, we spent a lot of time on poetry and you're perhaps thankful for some examples of poetic devices because you're working with poetry. But what do you do in narrative? Is there anything as exciting in narrative? Oh, there is. Uh, there's just one example, a polysemantic pun. Poly means many. Semantic is meaning. Some words have more than one meaning. In the book of Job, you can have the word tikwa, which can mean hope and it can mean thread. And so when Job says that uh, his days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and its thread comes to an end. In other words, the, the weaver is working so fast and suddenly the weaver runs out of thread on the loom. But his point in the context is not literally about a weaver and a shuttle and thread. What he's talking about is his life is going by so fast and he has an issue, a problem with God. God's taken everything he owns. God's taken all ten of his children away in death. He has only his wife left. He's taken away his health so his wife doesn't even want to be near him anymore because the breath that he has is so bad, the stink and stench of the sores and wounds on his body. Life has turned into a severe trial and the quality of life is totally gone. And he has a complaint with God. But he feels like the time is passing so quickly and his life is passing so quickly, he feels like there's no resolution that can be done in the short time he has left. Therefore, his life passes as swiftly as a weaver's shuttle that comes to an end without thread. The word thread also means hope. He feels hopeless. That's a polysemantic pun. And that's in poetry. But here's one in narrative. The story of Joseph. Remember? This verse here says, uh, hu, So they took him, Wayashliku, and cast Oto him. Haborah into the cistern. Wahaborek and the cistern was empty. Ain bo mayim. There was no water in it. You go a little bit further in the story, chapter 40, verse 15. He's in Egypt. He's been in the household of Potiphar. His Potiphar's wife has accused Joseph of lewd advances. She was the one who was lewd and she was the one who made the advances. He fled. She accuses him before his employer. And what is, he, what is done with him? He's put in jail. He's put in the dungeon. But look at the word that's used for dungeon. Ki gunov, gunavti. There's your, uh, your uh, cognate infinitive absolute. Your pre-positive intensive. Cognate infinitive absolute. Ganav used twice. Gunov, the PL in, uh, infinitive absolute. And Gunav T, the Pu'al perfect first common singular. So I, because I have certainly been stolen. 
may Eretz from the land, Ha Ivrim of the Hebrews, Wagam Po, and even here, Lo Asiti Me Uma, I have done nothing blameworthy. Ki Samu, that they should put Oti, me, Babor, in this pit. Look how that ties it together. That ties the whole story together. Because Bor is not only a cistern in the wilderness that can hold water, but that cistern was empty. Now it's used of the dungeon. And when you look at that, life was the pits for Joseph. He went from one pit to another. That's not my idea. That's not what I'm saying and bringing out. That's what the author is saying. This is what Moses wrote. It's his point. Now what can you learn from that? Whether it's your brothers or your family that do it to you or whether it's the world that does it to you, life can be very unfair and life can be terrible. Life can be the pits. We even use that terminology as an idiom in English which makes it so nice here to refer to. But through it all, what does Joseph do? He trusts in God. He serves God. He remains faithful in spite of his circumstances, in spite of all the unfairness that occurred to him. And in the end, he's going to triumph. Amazing things are going to happen to him. I've been counseling an uh, individual here recently. It's undergoing a, a, just a severe trial. And I can't believe all he's facing. All the difficulties, the problems, the issues, the trials, the pain, the sorrow, the grief, the agonies he's going through with regard to personal relationships in his own family. Life is the pits for him right now. But one of the things I try to encourage him in is regardless of how bad it is right now, if he remains faithful to God and remains humble and wants to des and desires and attempts to do what God wants of him, Regardless of what happens to him, eventually there will be a time when God will reward him for that faithfulness. He may get it in heaven rather than here. He may receive it here. We don't know. But there is a reward. That's an area that you need to watch for again. Notice that is not something you gain from the English. None of our Bibles say that dungeon and pit are the same or cistern are the same word. You see it only in the Hebrew. Here's how you find out some of those things. The Berit Olam series, Jerome Walsh, Style and Structure and Biblical Hebrew Narrative, and Conrad Schaefer on the Psalms. These are literary analysis volumes. Fantastic ones. Check to see if the Berit Olam series has the text that you're working on. It will give you some magnificent clues with regard to the literary devices found within your passage of scripture, no matter where you're at.